Welcome, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us today in this uh, webinar where we'll be talking all about uh, BIM, Revit plugins, and streamlining the workflow. Uh, and we've got some really special guests with us today, so super excited to have them with us. Uh, here with me is uh, right now uh, Chris Atkinson, uh, who's here and uh, soon to join uh, in, later in the, uh, in the webinar. We have a, a couple panelists with us. So uh, speaking about the uh, Revit plugin is Ragu. He's on the Matterport team, and uh, we'll, we'll uh, dive into that and know a lot more about it, uh, what that can do for you. Uh, with me here is Chris Atkinson, uh, who's our DBO specialist, uh, who's going to talk uh, a little bit about uh, what the BIM files are, what that can do for you. And you'll also be interviewing our two panelists. And we're very, very excited to have them with us. Uh, Jim and Michael. Jim is with us from Autodesk and Michael Elder from uh, Arup. So super excited. Both of them have been using the, uh, the Revit plugin as well as uh, BIM files. Uh, so we're very excited to uh, learn a little bit about their uh, use of those two tools. Uh, my name is Amir, and I am uh, with Matterport. I'm the senior evangelist, and I'll just be kind of taking you through a couple slides uh, before we get into the tools themselves. Uh, so let's go ahead and just get started. All right, so a few things before we kick it off. Um, a lot of questions are going to be asked. I know this because we had a very similar uh, webinar recently, and a lot of really great questions were asked there. So by all means, don't wait for us to get to the Q&A session. Uh, we've got a lot of folks here from Matterport ready uh, to answer your questions. So please go ahead and submit those. Uh, if you do have questions specifically for uh, Jim and Michael, uh, absolutely should be uh, submitting those in the Q&A panel is the best place to do that. Uh, the chat panel is great to notify us about audio issues and things like that. But for questions specifically to uh, the Matterport team or to uh, Jim and Michael, please go ahead and use the Q&A panel. Um, like I said, we will have the uh, Q&A session at the end. This is being recorded. So all of your questions that will be answered uh, live, you can revisit those uh, later on, basically. So hopefully... Uh, later this week, we'll have this up and posted and ready for you to view on demand. And let's see what else. All right. So today's agenda is uh, this, basically, different values you can obtain from BIM files and Revit plugin. We'll be talking all about that. So this is a very AEC-related webinar. We will have a customer panel, as I mentioned, with uh, Michael and Jim. So very much looking forward to that. Uh, Chris will be hosting that one, and then we'll have the live Q&A at the end. Because we do have Jim and Michael here uh, during this webinar, we're gonna try and do everything we can to uh, really ask them those questions live. Uh, all the other questions, you know, we can address uh, uh, later on, but we will prioritize those questions for Jim and Michael uh, at the end. So uh, if you do have them, uh, don't be shy, ask at any time. And that's about it for me. I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to Christopher. Hey, Chris, how's it going? Thanks so much for joining us. I know it's a bit late in your neck of the woods. It's okay. Thanks, Amir. Thanks very much for having me here. It's a pleasure to be talking about the, the new product launch here today. So today we're looking to introduce you guys to Matterport BIM file. Essentially, what we're talking about here is the scan to BIM workflow that we kind of know and go through. This is a very manual, mundane process. So what we're actually doing is taking the reality captured environment that you can see on the screen and converting this to a building information model. For those who already work with Matterport, you'll be aware that the workflow does require a bit of manual work already. It requires access to your Matterpack bundle to either access your OBJ or XYZ point cloud format. That sometimes then needs converted to be maybe an RCP if you are going into an Autodesk compatible format or another third party software. But generally, this case of inserting your data into your design software and manually modeling over the top is standard industry practice. So what we want to do here at Matterport is to make this process much simpler and more efficient for our customers. So with that, we're excited to introduce our newest product offering, Matterport BIM file. 
this is essentially a direct order BIM file from your Matterport account. This allows you to jumpstart your processes by removing that manual scan to BIM modeling. As simulated on the screen, you can see now you have various options for building packages that you can include with your Matterport BIM file. The base level includes the architecture package. So this is the core or shell of the building. And then on top of that, you can add additional elements, including interior furniture as a layout or MEP. And as you can see, you can see these modeled in the commercial office space here in New York on the screen. All of this information that you capture inside your space is then translated to you automatically and delivered as a ready to use building information model. So what we're doing here is we're actually leveraging the capture technology that Matterport is already known for, but we're actually taking that one step further to provide you with a workable asset in the form of a BIM file. Our target goals, as always, is to make our customers workflows faster, easier and more cost effective. That starts right from the beginning with the ease of use and fast capture technology that we have. And now this allows us to go through the entire project timeline and to influence and kick off your project, your drafting processes of your project. So what are the, deliver the, de the deliverables of a Matterport BIM file? So what we're actually providing you as part of the BIM file, the core BIM file is actually an Autodesk Revit model in RVT format. What we also have on top of this is we have already pre-extracted floor plans and reflective ceiling plans in a .dwg format so that you can share that information immediately with anybody else in the design team or stakeholders on the project. The building elements that you can see in each package are listed here, um, starting with our standard base architecture package that's included with all elements. And then you have the ability to pick and choose what suits your project. So you have the ability to add on your interior furniture or add on your MEP. Or if you want all elements, you can have the all-in-one solution and include all three of these. You can really select the building elements that suit your specific space and its needs. One thing to note on here in relation to the Revit file, the actual BIM file, is the compatibility of it. Um, as we know, it tends to roll forward versions. So we are supporting uh, and creating our files in Revit 2020 and later. So one of the burning questions that I'm sure is already in the chat at the moment is in terms of the level detail and the, or level of development that the BIM file is provided in. Well, what we're doing with the BIM file here is we're working to an LOD 200 specification. In certain cases, this can arguably lean towards LOD 250. But this is a basic shell schematic level for space, spatial placement of elements within your site. As you can see from the video on the screen, as we look at the various building assets, you can kind of see the furniture and the MAP, and these are modeled to a slightly higher level. And that's because we're talking about dimensional placement of these elements, including things like MAP connections. So it is important to note that for elements like furniture that you're seeing on the screen at the moment, we currently don't offer any family customization. And the elements that are placed into the model at the moment are typically best volumetric placeholders and those used from the Autodesk standard families library. This does mean, however, that once you've received your BIM file, these elements are easily interchangeable. You can actually drop your own families from your own libraries into there just by swapping one asset out for the other. It's important to know that in relation to what we are providing you with the BIM file, it's understanding the, the physics and the way uh, capture technology works. If we can't, we model it. So for MEP elements, for example, exposed ceiling, yes, those are captured, they're visible. We will model those for you. But if they are within a ceiling void and they are covered over, then that won't be included in your BIM file. This really does highlight the need for the person on site or the capture technician to understand the areas of the project which need to be adequately captured so that they are accurately translated into the BIM file. 
one of the things that we look at with Matterport is that we support a number of capture devices, everything from your mobile phone in your pocket up to a high end laser scanner. So one thing I would say is that when you are considering the BIM file, choose the right tool for the job. Uh, currently, for BIM files, we are supporting spaces that are captured with our own infrared Pro 2 camera and the Leica BLK laser scanner. I guess the visual here shows you um, some of the strong points in terms of these. And as I said, it's really important to choose the right tool for the job, depending on the space that you have. So to access the BIM files and to place an order, what you have to do is you have to have admin access rights. Here you would go into the settings, you would scroll down to our add-on section and you'll see a little tick box here for BIM file. Simply flick that on to activate the option to place an order. You would then go into your space, the space that you want to create the BIM file for, the add-ons tab where you usually get your matter packs from and you will see the BIM files add-on there. If you select that, it will give you information about the pricing in terms of the space um, per square footage, square meterage. It will have example files and FAQs in there. What you would do is you would choose the building elements that you want to choose, your architecture, furniture and MEP. And before you go to actually place your order, we will provide you with a quotation of what that cost for modeling that BIM file will be. Again. Once you place that order for the BIM file, just it'll take us a little time to actually model that up. And again, depending on the size of the project square footage, those times may vary. And that is in the FAQ. But what you will get is when that file is ready to download, you'll get a notification on your email or in your Matterport account to let you know that you can download the BIM file directly. What we're talking about here ultimately is a BIM file that is designed to provide you with a quick an easy base layer for your existing site conditions so that you can go and start to begin and layer your own parametric information and continue to model your site specific conditions based on whatever standards you're actually using. The BIM file product here really does simplify the workflow by tasking Matterport to take care of creating the base BIM file and allowing your teams to focus on more prominent parts of the project things like creating design options and building in various levels of data to that building information model. Hopefully that's give you a good snapshot of the BIM files section of today's webinar. What I'd like to do now is to hand over to Raghu, who will go on a little bit about our Revit plugin. Thank you, Chris. Right, uh, that was a great summary on BIM. Let's uh, pivot here and talk about the second uh, second topic that we wanted to cover the second product feature that we want to cover today is the Matterport plugin for Revit and the main goal with uh, with this plugin is to streamline your process to convert and import Matterport files directly into Revit essentially make Matterport seamless within your workflows and uh, the way we do that is is um, is by by um, letting this plugin do two things for you. One, uh, it can import your Matterport cloud files, which is the point cloud information, either in e XYZ or E57 format, and seamlessly convert them. Uh, you didn't, so to, to reiterate, uh, you would not have to go through the conversion process into recap Revit formats, but the plugin does that for you. That's number one. Second uh, feature with the plugin is, uh, if you have a BIM file, already associated with the space, it's going to seamlessly download that into a, your Revit project. And all, all of this while sitting within your Revit installation. And how do we do that? Uh, we use industry standard OAuth um, implementation for secure connection from uh, Revit into Matterport account. And uh, we'll, we'll go through a demo for this uh, application in a moment. But all of this is possible today and the app is readily available for you to download and use from the Revit App Store today. So as I, as I stated previously, this is available for download. And what you're seeing here is once the plugin is installed, you would see the import button for Matterport appearing on, um, on, on the add-ins bar. You would log into Matterport account, select a space, 
And uh, the plugin goes through the process of downloading the XYZ or E57 or, um, and, and go through the conversion process in the specific demo. It's a, E5, it's a uh, XYZ file that's going through the conversion process, but the process remains the same. If you had a BIM file, it, there would not be conversion, but it would be a direct download into your project. So yeah, so this is the finally converted uh, XYZ point cloud file through the plugin. And what you notice through this flow is um, as, as an user, you did not have to leave in your leave your Revit installation. You could do the connection to Matterport account directly from with, within your Revit installation or a Revit seat. Finally, to pull this all together, here's a quick summary of uh, all the different offerings and possibilities with the, with the Revit plugin and the BIM files and the point cloud. What you see on the top here is a current workflow, which is completely manual. There's a four-step process. Uh, you would generate a point cloud for a captured space. You would manually import that point cloud into recap and go through the conversion process. Um, uh, and finally, once you generate a recap uh, Revit compatible project, then you would import that into Revit so, and design, design, uh, complete the design within, within Revit itself. So that's the current manual workflow. And now uh, what you see in the next uh, second horizontal bar there is by using the Revit plugin and a Matterport BIM solution, this entire four steps are simplified by you, for you. Uh, you first create a Matterport BIM file using the add-in uh, process that, uh, that Chris demoed. And uh, once that file is available, you could use the Revit plugin to directly log into Matterport, download the BIM file into your Revit seat, which is all four steps are automated for you. Now, the next one, if you do not use the plugin, then you, would, you could still get the BIM file, but you would have to go through the manual process of downloading, logging into Matterport account offline and uh, importing it into, into um, into your Revit installation. And the third one that you see here is um, if you do not want to go through the BIM file creation process, then you could still use our point cloud XYZ file. And um, the way you would do it is um, the demo that we saw in the previous slide where you connect to Matterport um, through the plugin again, uh, select the space, and the plugin will do the conversion for you. And, uh, and once the project is imported, you can um, draft the model within Revit. Um, and then last one is, is the most basic of all. If you did not want to go through all of these, then uh, you would you still get a Matterport, Matterpack file and import it and go through the conversion process uh, by importing it manually uh, into Recap and then, and, and then the manual step of, uh, of uh, drafting the file. So net-net, um, uh, there are different offerings. The simplified process end-to-end -end would be for you to get a BIM file, um, import it through the Revit plugin, and, um, and that's how I would recommend go, go, going about it. Cool. I think that's, uh, that's essentially summarizes our Revit plugin. In, in a nutshell, uh, it, the goal of the plugin is to bring it into your workflows and simplify the process of connecting to Matterport from within your Revit seat. That's great. Thanks so much, Ragu. I really appreciate that. Um, all right. So let's bring in Michael and Jim and uh, Chris, who's going to be uh, taking care of this uh, this panel discussion. Great. Thanks, Emil. And it's a pleasure. Thank you, Jim and, and Michael, for taking the time to, to join us for our BIM launch today. Um, just to give a little context and background on you guys. Jim Quancy is Senior Director, Developer Advocacy and Support at Autodesk. Um, he has many years of engineering and design experience and has been spent the last 30 years developing relationships for Autodesk with leading, leading technology suppliers. Um, currently, he oversees a network of over 7,000 software partners who customize, complement, and extend Autodesk desktop technologies and Autodesk cloud solutions. We also have Michael Alder, who is Regional Reality Capture Lead for Arup in the Australasian region. Michael utilizes and has implemented a number of reality capture technologies for Arup, including both laser scanning and photogrammetry. And he influences the whole BIM process in relation to on-site capture through to modeling and collaboration of the collected data on projects. So Michael and Arup have actually been Matterport users since 2015, I believe. 
Sounds impressive if you say all of that stuff really quickly. Chris, thanks for that. <laughs> no problem at all. Um, so I'd like to start with you, Jim. Um, being a obviously a software provider here, you'll be very familiar with some of the pain points that customers face when doing scan to BIM workflows. So I'm just wondering if you can highlight a few of those scan to BIM issues that your customers may be facing. Yeah, Chris, um, you know, it's all about how manual it's been and how increasingly automated the process has been. Um, we, can, we can go back a ways when you had a steel tape and you actually had to measure things and, you know, make notes. And then maybe you had a laser measuring device and, you know, invariably you'd leave and you'd find out you missed something. And, you know, that's been going on for years. And a lot of people are kind of still doing that. Um, but there's no question with, like with the Revit plugin with Matterport, you know, you can capture those existing conditions extremely accurately. You can do it once and not have to go back and do it a second time. Um, and what's been happening with BIM, people, you know, taking existing conditions, whether it's kind of a brownfield situation where you're, where you're renovating a building, or maybe it's, you know, digital twin and you need a model and you have this building that's 50 years old. Um, and it's, it's been a lot of man hours, no if thens or buts and a lot of pain, getting it right and not missing things. So yeah, this sure. today's all about making that easy. Sure. So, I mean, from your position, how do you think Matterport are introducing today in terms of the Revit plugin and the BIM file? You know, how do you think that you now to tackle these pain points? Yeah, well, from you win a project to the time you can actually start making money and making money typically is creating designs, delivering models, starting to crank out sheets. That's how a lot of design firms measure, you know, how they're doing from a profitability point of view. Um, so clearly capturing that information quickly, not in days, not in several hours, but in maybe an hour, kind of depending on the size of the facility we're talking about and being able to quickly get that into Revit, where you can start laying down, you know, real models or automating the creation of the model um, as the service you're offering. You know, it's it's time to value, time to money gets really speeded up. Sure. Thank you very much. And then, Michael, just to, to start asking you some questions about the BIM file. Obviously, you've been using it through the development of the product with Matterport here. So I'm just keen to understand what your experience was of, of Matterport BIM file and, and what benefits you saw from utilizing it. Yeah, thanks, Chris. I think the, the thing that stood out to me was really the, uh, the quality of the modeling was probably better than I expected. You sort of go in with a fairly low expectation, and it was—it surprised me. I, I was—I um, was impressed uh, with what came back, and um, and then once I actually loaded up the the, the Revit add-in, um, and and just the ability is to link link that information directly in, it really just started to make a lot of sense. Um, where any time we can start reducing workarounds, re reducing um, the steps along the whole path. We can simplify the process. More and more people in within the organisation can get involved. So instead of having it leaving it up to some, you know, BIM hero like myself, you know, I be, I just end up becoming a um, uh, what do you call it, um, a pain point, as Jim was saying, because everything can't go through one person. So the more you can distribute that uh, out to the team and enable them to actually take take control, the better it is. So. Anytime we have any of these sorts of um, advances and, and it becomes run of the mill everyday kind of work, it, it's a benefit to everyone, I think. Um, oh, great. And I'm guessing because the, the, the kind of base level BIM file was delivered to you, that meant that you had an opportunity to concentrate your efforts in, in more prominent areas. Well, yeah, exactly. So the, the idea being that instead of having to check for resources, understand um you know many all the different aspects of the workflow if there's something that we can do just to simplify that uh if, if everyone's too stretched it gives us an option and I, I guess that's the thing i i sort of see this as is it's an additional option instead of having one particular workflow you have multiple threaded workflows so it actually can simplify the um the process 
from someone who's trying to organise resources, uh, or or even if you're working with um, other partners who might not have those those skills, you can point them towards this as an option to um, assist them, because it's not always done uh, just within an Arab environment. We're working with uh, architects, builders, subcontractors, many many different partners who all might be brand new to the the um, the BIM process. So anything like this that that can um, uh, offer opportunities, I, I think, is a good thing. Great, great, and and obviously, I'm keen to kind of give the the audience here a, a little bit of an example of the workflow you actually went through. So you were kind enough to share some some models and some videos with us. So if we could just bring that slide up, if you could just tell us a little bit about you know the reason why you looked at BIM file and what workflow and what software you went through to to get to the end of the project, that would be appreciated. Sure. Yeah, well, I was. This is the Robin Boyd House, which is a heritage um, house in in Melbourne, and you can see the cable suspended roof there. It's a unique um, feature of this house. It's a, the architect's um, own residence, and the the problem with cables is over time. So this is mid century sort of building. Over time, those cables stretch. So I was brought in just to do some laser scanning initially of those cables to to actually measure. The deflection and sort of see how it um, how it's evolved over time. So you can sort of see that really flexible roof. So as is my practice in in most projects, as I'm laser scanning, because a laser scanner takes you know, 10 15 minutes per station, I'll also do a Matterport because the the nice thing about the Matterport is immediately I can send something back to the client the next day for the virtual tour and also for the internal team, so they can actually use that. Um, as, a, as a virtual walkthrough. That was the, the initial purpose of the Matterport originally. And obviously since our initial use, it has actually grown and grown in its usefulness. So this is a perfect opportunity. I thought, oh yeah, we're, we're in here. Let's just see what uh, these guys can do. So I threw this, this project uh, into the BIM beta and I was really impressed with what, what came out. You can see there I'm, I'm clicking on the, uh, the roof. It's not just a block, a straight piece of, um, Modeling there, it's a, a curved uh, surface, you know, and and I thought straight away this has got some uh, real value. So then what I did is I started overlaying the laser scan, which I did, and to compare, well, how accurate is this actual model? And once again, I can see um, discrepancies, but they're, they're small and easily managed. Um, and here you can see how I share the models and the scans um, with the team. It's, an, it's a nice way of visualizing the image as well as the, the model. So you can sort of see how I'm comparing the modeling and the, the, the scanning and the laser uh, scanning uh, all together. So yeah, look, I, I was uh, I was really happy with uh, the result. And for this uh, heritage building, where well, there's um, lots of 2D drawings by the architect himself, it's it just simplifies that whole process of bringing that into a, uh, into a, into a, a model environment. Yeah, sure. That's great. I mean, it's really nice to see a workflow there of you starting with the Matterport, then receiving the BIM file from us, and then comparing it between the two to, to, to double check, you know, and, and make sure that it is as you expect. And as you've mentioned, this isn't a, a straightforward building here. It's quite complex in terms of the curvature and, you know, yeah. that, that, that roof system on there. Um, I am aware you obviously took this information as well, and you've been doing some some fantastic work um, internally with with various apps on the phone and using the, the BIM file inside that app as well. Um, so I think we've got a, another slide to, to showcase that. Um, I was really impressed when I saw this. It was it was kind of a unique a unique way to use kind of augmented reality and you know a bit of a mix, um, but key and central to that you know to be able to get augmented reality to, to kind of work play in the fields that we do. You need the BIM and you, you need the building information model there sitting behind it to be able to see the assets that are hidden or yet to be installed. Um, so yeah, if you could give, just give us a, a little bit of a summary of this, that would be really really great. Sure. This this was a um, a bit of a test uh, project uh, working with partners for you. Um, and so what we did is um, this is our own office building uh, for our own. Um, uh, office space in in Melbourne for the for the Arab uh, Melbourne office, and we designed the base building as well as the tenancy. 
And I took that as an opportunity to scan Laser and Matterport during construction as well as post-construction. So we did a full um, scan verification. You can see there we've got the, the construction site um, Matterport. And we thought we'd take an opportunity to start you know, incorporating this into an augmented reality app. And so the Matterport formed part of that as well as the architectural models, as well as the verified as-built MEP. And so I guess this is the thing that I really enjoy um, is the additional um, application of the Matterport as the basis within Unity in this case to start taking in live data. You can see the temperature sensor on the wall and then incorporating that into a, a useful app to see how can we use this technology to use it for, how can we use it for, you know, even just finding and linking drawings for assets. You can sort of see the, um, the overlay of the model over the top of the, the, the Matterport walkthrough. There's the wayfinding. So this is really, this is not in use currently, but what, what it's used for was to test the limits. What can we do with augmented reality using uh, Matterport as part of that, um, that capture? Yeah, sure, that's great. So there's obviously the, the, the scan data has been brought in there for the various stages that you've scanned that. But what you're seeing there is obviously the, the BIM file sitting behind that. And yep. in terms of getting hold of the, the kind of base BIM file that Matterport are offering now, what level of customization did you take and add to that kind of model after um, after we had, we had sent you that? Well, it's really about adding data to it. The, the information that you can see here as we click on a, um, because we can scan during the uh, installation process, we can actually, you know, effectively see behind the walls and then we can start adding in data like this. So the owner manuals um, for maintenance, for example, and then we can start adding links to live data. So all of that kind of stuff is custom, but what, by having a BIM file, um, it, it, it sort of shortcuts this process down uh, in, in regards to acquiring the, the, the 3D information to start with. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah sure. One of those and, it, and it really is kind of going towards this direction of a kind of fully integrated digital twin, you know, where the, the, the digital world is reflecting the real world in, in real time. And, and it's great to see kind of Matterport being used as the base to kind of go along those. Um, Jim, just to bring you back in and ask you a, a, another question. Obviously, we're seeing technology kind of evolving at such a rapid pace now. You know, we've had BIM and BIM's been around for 15, 20 years, and people have developed it to various levels and, and standards that they get benefit out of it. Now we're moving towards the likes of digital twin, which is a, a big buzzword here in the industry. But what kind of critical problems do you see Autodesk? facing and your customers facing over the coming years? Again, again I, I think, I believe the big challenge is 98% of the assets of the buildings in the world are uh, 2D PDF files, if you're lucky. Um, and, you, you know, and as Michael put it, once you get the BIM, you can start adding intelligence. Um, but creating the BIM is, painful. It takes time, it takes people. So again, uh, you know, the automatic, whether it's the automatic creation of the BIM model or the easy bringing in the Matterport information into Revit, um, just accelerates the whole process. And that initial capturing of the BIM model, it's kind of scout work. It's the kind of the work you kind of give to the junior architect, hey, you go do that. Because um, nobody wants to do it and it's never fast enough. Um, so it kind of gets, gets you through that. So you can start doing what I'll call high value work, um, really adding that intelligence to the models. Yeah, great. That's that, I mean, I, I've done scan the BIM for a number of years in practice and, and face these exact issues. You know, it becomes quite mundane at times, kind of modeling over the top, essentially tracing the reality capture information that you've got. Whereas we could have been moving along the line to, to do something, you know, more, more beneficial, more, more impactful, of more value with our times if something like BIM files was available. 
And I guess, Michael, before we look to close out and, and start our, our Q&A um, with the general public, um, what I'd like to ask you is, is the same question. So from Arab side of things, what critical problems do you see your customers and yourselves facing over the next couple of years? I, th I think it's the, um, it, it's the general expectation that this is the new normal. So for us, it's the the demand. <clears throat> excuse me. The the demand. Ever since we started using Revit, I think back in two thousand seven, between two thousand seven two thousand nine, it was sort of it, it became it, it was the special projects that really needed the three D. You know, now everything is modelled. Everything has a standard attached. It's it's the it's the basic um, expectation that all projects um, are run this way and. I think in the last oh, five, six years, it's the construction industry that is now completely on board in, in regards to um, builders, um, MEP subcontractors. It's now it's now the normal. So I think one of the biggest challenges is resourcing, to be honest. Resourcing and quality uh, are, the, are the real issues. The, the, time, the timelines keep reducing. The expectation keeps going up. So it's that it's that sort of resourcing quality staff, quality um, outputs to, to maintain that, and and we do a lot in regards to templates, um, and you know running out global templates as a full team, constantly working on these things, as as the um, the software improves, as there's more and more interoperability, interoperability between different software packages there's always updates, there's always work going on. So it's keeping on top of that and making sure what we're delivering is still quality while being um, upfront and on top of that development curve. I, I think for us, that's what I would see as the, the big challenges. And I think if you're stepping into this whole field for the first time, it, it's pretty overwhelming. Um, obviously we've got a long history of um, technology, um, development we've got our own programmers but that there's a lot of history there and a lot of development i think if you're stepping into this as a new um a new operator there's so much more available now than there was but that's part of the problem it's it can be overwhelming how much is out there and how much to take in yeah, I'd agree with you. And I think you hit on two things there that I think BIM files will be really beneficial towards in that, you know, for those first trying it and not having the expertise or the skill sets to actually be able to do scan to BIM workflows, this is a, another offering for them to, to essentially add additional services to their, their output. And then again, resourcing, you know, as you've said, having having the teams there working away modeling creating these building information models if we can kind of ease that a little bit more it adds time and area for your team to 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 get more value um so yeah thank you very much guys i appreciate you taking the questions from me um i think we'd like to to move along and and see if there's any questions in the q a thanks everybody really appreciate that yeah let's uh let's go to q a uh, we did get some questions coming in, but uh, certainly if, uh, if you haven't submitted your question, go ahead and do that through the uh, Q&A panel, uh, and we'll just go ahead and read them off um, as they come in. So first question uh, that came in is actually to Jim. How does the service overlap with the current point cloud functionality in Autodesk Docs? Um, great question. You know, I was going to mention earlier something Michael and I talked about was how much of all these processes can we move to the cloud? Because whether it's a BIM, whether it's a BIM model or whether it's a point cloud, um, the data sets get more detailed and bigger, and moving them around is just ugly. And frankly, for a lot of the stakeholders getting value, they just need to see. They don't want a big honking app. They're not doing modeling. They just want to be able to share the information with most of the stakeholders. So we need to make that easier. Um, Autodesk Docs is very much about making this information uh, easier and more accessible. Um, you know, I think there's a loaded question there, which is when will things like point clouds be uh, viewable through um, Docs as you would in a Revit environment? Um, 
which is something we're working on. And I can't say when, but um, it's not at the bottom of the pile. It's close to the top of the pile. Great, very nice. Uh, all right, thanks for that. Um, okay, uh, another question. Uh, this one, Michael, you may be able to help us out with this. Uh, how does the IoT data uh, data uh, get into the Matterport file? Is this coming in from connected or Revit models? Um, I think they're referring to the model that we looked at um, and all you know the temperatures and things like that. Yeah, did did yeah. you personally work with Foria on that project? I know it's it's with uh, Foria and SDK partner. Yeah, so Foria did the um, the actual augmented reality app. Uh, so we provided all of the uh, IoT data live from the BMS system. So we had our own, um, uh, how do you call it, interface into the BMS system, which went out, <clears throat> excuse me, and then got brought in separately. So it's so the Matterport really, in this case, was providing the base mesh and uh, walkthrough, and the Foria app was giving the location, so it would it would relocate itself within the actual uh, office environment, so it was contextually correct, and so you could actually see those temperatures, and you could so, so you saw a green and a blue sort of overlay, so there was like a visualization of the temperatures in the space. So we we played with a few different things in there. Um, so yeah, it was a partnership. So we provided the data and the, and the models, the Matterport, and, and at the time they actually pulled that together into their uh, augmented reality app. So the IoT was directly from the BMS uh, through a, um, and this is why I'm not a programmer, yeah, through a separate database that was updated, I think every 15 minutes. If, if I may, for anybody out there who's a web developer or access to a web developer, once you have the BIM model, you know, whether it's an IFC file or an RVT file or kind of whatever, um, there's a forged data visualization extension that makes it really easy to connect IoT data to your building information model. Um, and whether that's kind of heat mapping stuff or you know hotspots with data, um, it's pretty straightforward for a web developer to build you know, that kind of web page. Nice. Nice, yeah. Uh, in this case, uh, you know, we used uh, or Michael, you, you used uh, uh, Foria, which is a Matterport SDK partner, and they were able to take the data that you gave them and just kind of put that into uh, into the AR system. And it's kind of all it all sits on top of Matterport. And like you said, it aligns uh, based on measurements that uh, in the beginning of of the video, uh, you can kind of see the camera moving around trying to grab these measurements, allowing, allowing the system to kind of get these measurements so it can line up all the different uh, layers. Yeah, that's right. And and it's sort of, since we've done that um, that initial test, just as Jim's mentioning, there's a lot more um, availability of this information uh, generally. And so it's less and less custom and more and more mainstream. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Nice. Cool. All right. Uh, let's see here. So we'll finish with that one. Um, is the Revit, Chris, this, this may be for you uh, best to answer. Is the Revit modeling automated from the Matterport point cloud or does the point cloud have to be sent to a Revit modeler to be manually modeled? So it's one of those things we've looked at it and, and AI is kind of the way that people want things to go. They want to automate the, the full processes as much as possible. Um, I think when we've got to it and we've looked at it, there's always that level of uh, manual quality checking that needs to be done as every space is uniquely individual. So there is that part of, there is that manual modeling process involved in the creation of the BIM file. So there is a... Uh... A team of, of experts who did spent as many years as you have, Chris, <laughs> modeling. And, uh, and I think uh, there's even someone like overseeing it. This, this is kind of like a big deal. Like it's, uh, yeah, quality checking in this kind of workflow, quality checking is, is fundamental. It has to be right. You know, if it's not right, then there's no point in actually doing it. And, and it was quite nice to see Michael's example there where he actually did take the BIM file with the point cloud and put that into the space. Um, now, Michael did say there was some tendencies where maybe the, the, the kind of cumulative error had kind of built up. And again, that, 
kind of goes back to looking at the methodology that you take when you actually go around a site. You know, the sites and the spaces are, are unique and specific, and it's important to understand and plan how you will tackle those spaces so that what you do is when you convert that to a BIM file, that we can provide it in the most accurate way possible. Yeah, and there was actually a question about that, Michael, if you don't mind getting into a little detail, specifically what those errors were that where you saw um, the, the discrepancies between the Matterport model and the laser scanning. Yeah, sure. The, the, I was really looking for errors because I like, you know, because someone's going to ask me the question internally after have an honest answer. And um, in that example there with the, the Robin Boyd uh, house, I was looking at the mullions along those walls. You can see those big glass panels. And from one side to the other side, it was getting out, I reckon, 25 mil. And the nice thing about Revit is that if I know that error is there, I can do a couple of site checks anyway and just have a couple of um, back checks. I mean, for me personally, it's not a massive worry because I'll probably be laser scanning it anyway. But the nice thing with the Matterport is the, the turnaround time. It, it really just cuts that turnaround time down. So if I'm aware of those errors, um, I think it's important to know so that when you talk to the team, you say, well, this is an LOD 200 model. I think if you're not overselling the, um, the quality in regards to the preciseness. So if you were looking for precise millimetre connections you know, in a chiller plant room, you might want to be careful about that. But in regards to that early stage, early engagement, um, uh, early engagement, I think it's it's perfectly fine. And the adjustability of the Revit model is really nice. It's not a you know, solid model cast out of uh, concrete. I can just tweak it a little bit if I need to as we go along. So I didn't see it as a big issue, to be honest. Um, and, it's, and it's awareness, exactly as Jim said, that it's an awareness um, as you're on site, you, you, you saturate it. You just get as much in there as you as you can, and you are aware of. I think the one of the nice things that um, having having your own camera is uh, your own scanners is you go into the space knowing what the actual critical points of that space are. If I know I'm doing an upgrade to this part of the the asset, I know I focus on that part of the asset, and that's the key. And so I'm I'm really looking for those um, key elements to be captured. Um, and, and literally saturated with, with um, scan points. So hopefully that answers the question. So there is an error, but there's an error with everything. So it's a matter of knowing what's the error and what's the, the criticality of that. And um, looking at the appropriateness of the technology for that application. So hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, great, uh, I think this might be a question for uh, the panel in general. Um, having the expertise you do have in the industry. Uh, do you foresee a time when LiDAR scanning VR everyday mobile devices will be the source of data capture? Uh, if so, how far off are we and what needs to happen with the, with the technology to make that happen? Yeah, I've, I've already, yeah, I wanted to answer this one because I've used um, an iPad 12 to do direct to E57 LiDAR. And what was cool, was once again, I'd, I got to compare it with a previous laser scan I'd already done. And it goes, I've totally forgotten. I think it's an Apple, um, I think it was an Apple app that was loaded with the iPad. And it was an iPad I was using for Matterport anyway. Uh, it just goes direct to E57. And so I think that that LiDAR sensor in the, in the Apple 12 products is useful. It's probably not good for huge captures, but it's definitely every day and direct and definitely color E57 direct off the device. And the accuracy was pretty good. Hmm. Nice. And so you were basically just holding the iPad, kind of waving it up and down all around, painting the E57, if you will, and uh, fleshing it out. Yeah, exactly right. And the, the things you don't get from that would be the, so it's like a mobile scan. You don't get this, the static, 360 color image that mm -hmm. you get off a, a head of a, a traditional laser scanner. Um, but I sort of see it as, um, you know, like we're talking about accuracy on site. Well, what you could do is run your Matterport around the space and then with the same um, iPad, and I don't have shares in Apple, so I'm not, it's just something we use. 
um, you could you could then run an an, an E57 along um, a particular area and use that as a back check for your measurements, for example, uh, to then and then convert that E57 to RCP, bring it into your Revit model and overlay it as a bit of a back check. So you could do some little spot checks to to verify the accuracy of your Revit model afterwards. So I guess that's my life is always looking for workarounds and and ways to to uh, to use that sort of technology. But at this stage, I would say you'd run out of space on the iPad if you tried to scan the entire building with that. Um, Chris, do you know if Matterport works with Unreal Engine? I'm, I'm pretty positive we do have a workflow through to a lot of the gaming engines, one of them being at, uh, Unreal. But again, I'll have to um, I'll have to have a closer look at the uh, the workflow for that. Ruggy, do you have any any indication on that workflow? Yeah, a couple of things to keep uh, that uh, the options exist. Um, as we know, Matterpack has an OBG and XYZ files, and there is a process and there is documentation on the Unreal website as well uh, on how you could uh, import those specific OBJ and XYZ files into Unreal. Yes, um, short answer is it is possible, and our Matterpack has the assets that you would require to import into Unreal. And beyond that, um, and maybe this uh, the specific use cases drive how you could customize. But um, yes, it's possible to start with. Uh, okay, we have another question here uh, for Michael, who mentioned a chiller plant room. If your majority of the work is in a chiller plant room or a boiler plant room, uh, as an engineer, is this a viable solution for scanning and BIM conversion? Yeah, I've been thinking about this one. Um... Uh, while Raghu was answering the last one. And I think, yes, but up to a certain point. The the very first scan we ever did was in a uh, chiller plant room. And immediately there's uses for that virtual tour. If I'm thinking about it, I would use that. I uh, guess I would get a uh, model created uh, by Matterport, but I would keep its use for the design side of things. So initial design scoping, I would keep it for the uh, initial space planning, um, that kind of thing. If I'm going to move into the, uh, how would I say it, the, the full construction side of it, I would want a laser scan for accuracy because once it moves, um, once that project moves into um, the contractor phase, they're gonna want a lot more accurate models because they're gonna be producing fabrication models, uh, ideally from that. But if you're using it for the initial planning, um, you know, is, is this piece of equipment going to fit here? Is this set of pipes going to fit here? That early stage? Absolutely. No problem. Uh, and it's a matter of then further developing that model with laser scans down the track. That's the way I would approach that. Chris, you can answer this. Uh, can scans that were done in the past, like a year ago, uh, be converted to BIM with a service? Yes, of course, as long as they've been done with, with one of the two compatible cameras. So if you do still have a, a space that was captured six months ago, a year ago, however long ago, as long as it was with a Matterport Pro 2 camera or the Leica BLK laser scanner, you can access and order that BIM file. I have a follow-up question to that. Um, you know, we, we definitely promote using the right tool for the right job. And sometimes that means using two tools for a job. You can use the Matterport for something and then maybe work in a uh, Rico Z1. If you have a Rico Z1 as part of the model, not all of it, but maybe just a couple outdoor scans or something like that, and you can't get rid of them, you can hide them, but that doesn't change anything. Uh, can that model too be used? Can, will that allow it? Or as long as... Do, do you know? My, un my understanding of that at the moment is that it's not, and that you need to have a, a space that is captured completely with one of the two compatible devices. Uh, by adding that additional non-compatible device, it has an effect on the, the process that we go through. Okay. Uh, so if anybody does run into that, uh, if you do happen to still have that model data, you can certainly create a duplicate of that uh, in capture, remove those uh, you know, non-compatible camera images or you know scan positions just delete those out of that duplicate file re-upload and uh and use that to, to create your bin models i guess that would be the workaround most definitely yes uh all right let's see we are close to the end but we do have a couple more questions here 
can you use machine learning to automatically tag assets and assets uh, and asset anyone doing uh, retrospective scanned BIM with the classification of BIM objects? Um, I think that's something that we're working on. Is that you right? Know, from, a, from a general point of view, that's already happening. I know okay. both uh, power companies and telecom companies that are doing exactly that. Great. So it is possible and they're doing it. I think um, what Derek's also asking is, is it possible to um, classify elements within the Matterport space prior to the model being created to then sort out your classification of your model? And I guess my answer is that I think this is a good direction to go. I don't think it's there yet within the Matterport space that I understand, but I think this is where there's some future development um, still to still to happen in this space regarding models, um, regarding templates, coordinates, so all that sort of stuff. I think is is all part of the the future work, the work path for this stuff. But that's that's a really good um, idea is the classification of elements in the modelling, but it's a high level of modelling that, that that's currently available. But yeah, I like where your heads out there. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And obviously we've we've launched Bimfile as, as a product today, but that's not to say, you know, this is the end of the development of Bimfile. You know, we will be taking on board recommendations, comments, questions, and developing that further. Um, as we said at the moment, in terms of customization, we've kind of drawn a line in the sand and this is what you get. We give you the base and you customize it further. But in the future, that's not to say that additional customization options won't be available. And just to add on to that, on the in terms of object detection, I know that, uh, there's an extended team that's not represented in the uh, webinar team here that's investing time and effort in object detection within Matterport. And there's also active conversation with some of our partners that have expressed interest for um, uh, doing object detection within within a Matterport captured space. So um, short answer, yes, we are uh, looking into that space and there's work going, happening internally within Matterport as well as with some of our partners as well. All right. Um, there was a, a question here. We got one minute left, so we'll just go ahead and, and go through this one, and this should be it. Um, my company used the Matterport to scan an office, but uh, the point cloud and OBJ are not so accurate. Uh, how can you improve the model? Um, I'll put in my two cents. For the best accuracy, uh, scan density is insanely important. The more scan positions you have, of course, there is a, you know, curve of uh, diminishing returns, so don't go too crazy, but uh, you want to have those scan positions relatively close to one another, meaning five feet-ish in that range, uh, one and a half meters. Uh, don't go scanning 10 to you know 12 feet apart from uh, each scan position. Um, anybody else want to chime in? Amir, I was wondering if the KD tags would assist with that as well. Certainly, depending on the architecture, uh, the April tags can absolutely help. I mean, I don't know anything about this specific model and what may have happened if uh, anything got misaligned, uh, certainly. And it could have been uh, aided with April tags, uh, certainly if it's kind of repetitive architecture, absolutely. Um, good. So that is it. We are at time. Thank you all very, very much. Really appreciate the time that you uh, took to, to uh, help us out today. Uh, Jim and Michael really appreciate it. Uh, I think we answered a lot of really great questions. And just as a reminder for everybody, this was recorded. We're going to be putting this out on demand uh, pretty soon, hopefully uh, no later than tomorrow or the next day. Uh, so you'll be able to uh, revisit any other questions that you may have missed. And other than that, uh, again, really appreciate it. And uh, take care. Have, uh, have a good one. Thank you. Thanks, Amir. Thanks,